words. I take seriously the message of the Sheikh, what he said, uh, what he was saying about the nature of God. And we were speaking on the way of salvation. And if I failed in anything tonight, I pray that I have sought to offer Christ to you with goodwill. That has been my aim. Let me try to answer the questions. You said that the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that God said to the other gods, so you were saying there are lots of gods. It's Isaiah 41, it's verses 21 to 24. It's a challenge. It's a, it's a hypothetical challenge in one sense because God is speaking as if there were other gods and he's saying one of the tests of truth is prophecy. God knows all things from the beginning to the end. I do not. I do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. You do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. God can reveal the future to his prophets. We believe he did that, that the prophets told the message of God and also prophesied the future. They said things would happen. In the Old Testament, they said that the Messiah would come. They, they said that he would have the Spirit of God upon him. They said he would bring justice. They said he would be rejected by the people and he would suffer and be put to death and that he would rise from the dead. And God says, let the other gods give prophecies. So it's a hypothetical thing. It's not saying that there are other gods. It's the other gods so-called cannot tell the future, therefore they are not gods. So the true God, one of the tests that uh, you and I and anybody else who is after the truth about God, one of the tests that we will seek is the test of prophecy. It's not the only test, but it is a crucial one. Okay. So it's in that context. There are no other gods. There is but one God. So that's the first question. Uh, the, the second one. So I'm not hogging the microphone. It's just they get rid of me first and then the shake bit back on. No man who really loves his son deliberately makes his son suffer, does he? So how could you say God would send his son to suffer and die? God is all-powerful. He could just save us if he wanted, couldn't he, without making Jesus suffer? That, that is the key question. That is, that is right at the heart of the matter. If you go back to my first point... We are in Adam. What's Adam's problem? Adam's problem is that God said to him, the day you eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. He's not bluffing. He's not saying, well, I didn't really mean that, and when you fall into sin, uh, I'll think of something else so that you can sidestep this. This is his law. This is his unchangeable law. Sin leads to death under the judgment of God. That's God's justice. If a, if a judge is just, he punishes the guilty and he exonerates the innocent. We talk about that in a civil sense, rightly so, but when you go back to the scriptures, it says that nobody is innocent. None. All for short of the glory of God. I haven't loved God with all my heart, mind, soul and strength. I should, you should, but I haven't. I do not love my neighbour as myself. I should, I try, they annoy me. <laughs> I annoy them. We are fallen people in a fallen world. God said if we sin, we die. He is just. He's also gracious. He steps into the breach and he pays the penalty himself. That's the Christian gospel. It must be paid. 
It's either paid by us or it is paid by Christ Jesus. That is what the, the Christian scriptures are saying to each one of us. And God so loved his people. He looked upon this fallen, dreadful world and he was moved with compassion and he acted justly and he acted with mercy. And his mercy does not cast aside his justice. If the magistrate says, oh, I'll just simply let you off, we won't worry about the penalty. We won't worry about the law. We would say the magistrate is corrupt. The law must be carried out because it reflects the character of God. It is carried out. God suffers in the person of his son, his own penalty. And therefore he shows mercy to all who repent and believe in him. We're under that. We pay the penalty or we accept that the penalty was paid by Jesus Christ. I've tried to explain that as well as I can. I can only urge you to, to go to the scriptures, to the Christian scriptures and to the gospels and to seek to read it for yourself. But the third one, how can we stop people going into Islam? How can we get Muslims to Jesus? What do you re recommend for us to do with these people? <laughs> I, uh, I'm a Christian minister. I, I have no uh, power to coerce anyone. I have no desire to coerce anyone. My desire is that you should know God in a saving way. Uh, that's all I can do. What people do is, is their business. I have no control over anybody who becomes an atheist, becomes a Muslim, becomes a Buddhist, becomes a Christian. Uh, that is a, a, to become a Christian is the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Uh, I don't see any point in stewing ourselves over what people become. Uh, God tells me what to do. I, I seek to make that known as well as I can. What you, what you do is what you do. That's not something I have any control over. And, uh, I don't stew over it. To the Christian priest, can I say I'm not a priest? A, a priest is someone who offers a sacrifice. I, I do not offer the sacrifice of the Mass. I tell about the sacrifice that took place. There's a huge difference. That's why I'm, I'm not called a priest. In the New Testament, Christ is called the Great High Priest. And the, the ministers of the church in the New Testament are not called priests. They are called pastors or teachers. So, I hope I'm not being pedantic there. Are Jews of today going to hell or what? Do they believe in Jesus? Do by definition, if you're talking about uh, not racially. You're not talking about a racial thing. Let's, let's not get confused. I, I have met Jewish Christians... I've met quite a number of Jewish Christians. Um, a few weeks ago, I was speaking to a group of Jewish Christians. They are Jews who have become believers in Jesus as the Christ. Okay. So I'm not talking about uh, a racial thing, but by definition, by definition, someone of the Jewish faith does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. By definition, he believes that, if he thinks about these things at all, um, that the Messiah is still to come. So he's looking ahead. I would try to, to uh, point out to such a person as well as I could that, that, that they're wrong, that the Messiah has come. He's fulfilled Old Testament prophecy and he will come again. He came to be the saviour. When he comes the second time, he'll be king of kings and lord of lords and that'll be obvious to all. I would seek to tell that to the Jew as much as I would tell it to anybody uh, who would listen to me. Um, there are a lot of pagan Australians out there that need to hear the message, and it's, it's, it's not to do with a, it's nothing to do with a racial thing. Uh, but by definition, Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. Otherwise, they would cease to be 
members of the Jewish faith. The nationality would still be Jewish, but the faith is not Jewish. Why are so many people leaving the church? According to Dr. David Billiken, many, many Christians are going away from religion. Why are so many going to Islam? Well, I think probably that might be better asked of a, of a Muslim um, as to why they're coming. I believe we live in grim days. The problem, this, you shouldn't hang out your dirty washing in in front of everybody, but uh, the question was asked, and so I think we'll have to answer it. Uh, since about the 1850s, there have been huge sections of the church that have ceased to believe in the authority of their own scriptures. Now, I, that's something historical, that's something that's happened. It's been the influx of what's called liberal theology, where Jesus is portrayed differently to as he's portrayed in the New Testament. The scriptures are set apart uh, as not necessarily the word of God, it's containing error. And it's led to uh, apostates, it's led to things like some supposed churches discussing you know, the ordination of homosexual ministers. Now, if you're down that far down the track, you are so far removed from what the Christian scriptures are saying that the only description is apostasy. We live in such days. Therefore, I've hung out all the dirty Christian washing, but that's the way it is. And I, that has been the great weakness of the church. It speaks with so many different voices now. Pastor, where does Jesus say he is God? And if the Bible is the book of God, why does it not conform with scientific facts and contain many contradictions and contains explicit material? A lot with his daughters, daughters-in-law. <laughs> There's three parts to that. Let me maybe go in reverse order. The Bible describes, in some places, the sins of the people of God. The Bible, in that sense, is honest. Uh, it tells us wrong things. Now, I know that is a problem with some of you Muslims, but try bear with me. The Bible speaks of the sins, not only of the pagans, but of those who are supposed to be the people of God. It speaks even of the greatest crime of all of those who are supposed to be the people of God. They put to death the Messiah. So the Bible does not hide these facts. It does not rejoice in them. The law tells us that these things were wrong, but it, the narrative parts of the Bible tells us that there were times, terrible times. We live in terrible times now in many sense. So you go back to the book of Judges and you've got the dark ages back there and people did dreadful things even though they were supposed to know the true God. And the Bible tells us those things. It's part of the message that sin is everywhere, in every culture, in every people, including those who are supposed to be the people of God. And so the Bible does not hide that. We are all sons of Adam. No one escapes. And that can mean dreadful things. I'm not sure about the sci why does the Bible not conform with scientific facts. So I'm not sure what you're getting at. Can I say I believe the theory of evolution is a load of nonsense? Uh, that there is no record in the fossils for a transition from one species to another. There are missing links. There are missing links in Charles Darwin's day. They are still missing links now. Charles Darwin's theory is, is not an advance of science. It is speculation upon speculation. The Bible is against the theory of evolution. Genesis chapter 1 says that all animals, mankind and uh, plants, reproduce after their own kind. Right? So there is a, a locking, in, locking in mechanism there. You can't go across species. Uh, if you were a farmer and you had cows, you wouldn't expect to wake up you know, a few years down the track and there's rhinoceroses or something. It, it, there's no evolution across species. It doesn't happen. 
Never has happened. And it, so if that's the science you're referring to, can I say, I, that's bad science. That's speculation. Uh, Darwin did a lot of harm, not just to theology, but he did a lot of harm to science. Uh, and the fact that... I, I think the day will come when people are embarrassed by evolution. It's unproven, it's unprovable. So I made an assumption there you're referring to evolution. If you weren't, I'm sorry. Where does Jesus say he is God? Jesus never sets himself up as simply one of the prophets. He is a prophet. He is the son of man and he is the son of God. He is true man. He is like us in every respect except sin. All the consequences of the fall are experienced by Jesus, but not the fall itself, not sin itself. So he is like us in every respect. He knows suffering. He knows struggle. Matthew chapter 4, he is tempted by the devil. It's a different kind of temptation because it's from the outside in. When we're tempted, it's from the outside in and from the inside out, isn't it? Yeah. The devil tempts us from the outside, but there's something in us that resonates with that. Not so with Jesus, but he was, he's tempted by the devil. So he's like us in all things. But he calls himself Lord. And he accepts it when people call him Lord. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And they understood what he meant. They picked up stones to stone him. Why? Because he was claiming to be older than Abraham, before Abraham was, I was. Abraham was 2,000 years before Jesus. Before Abraham was, I was. Therefore, I must be more than 2,000 years old. Don't pick up stones to stone him for that. It's for blasphemy. They knew what he was saying. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He wasn't saying I'm over 2,000 years old. He's saying I am eternal. Before Abraham was, I am. At the resurrection, Thomas does not believe that... He's one of the twelve. He's one of the twelve disciples. He does not believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. I can't believe that, he says. Now, Judas has suicided. There's ten left. Ten say, we saw him last Sunday. He was standing in our midst. He's alive again. He's defeated death. He said, I am the resurrection and the dead. He is. And Thomas said, I don't believe you. I don't care if ten of you tell me that. I'm not going to believe a story like that. And the following Sunday, Jesus appears in the midst of his disciples and he says, look at these hands and look at these feet and do not be unbelieving but believing. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Thomas is a strict monotheist. we I see, if you're a Christian, you're a monotheist. If you're a Muslim, you're a monotheist. You believe in one God. The Jews were monotheists. The first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods beside me. Thomas was raised on that. All of the disciples were raised on that. They believe that. They're not out there with the Romans. Oh, there's gods everywhere. Right? There's one God. But this man raised on strict monotheistic soil, he says, my Lord and my God... And Jesus said, blessed are you who have seen and believed. But a greater blessing would go to those who have not seen but believe. And so Jesus pronounced a blessing on that confession. Mary used to wear a veil. Why are Christians against this? To the priest, I'm not a priest. Um, I... I accept that Mary wore the veil. If you want to wear the veil, that's fine. I'm not against it. Not at all against it. That, let each wear what he wants to wear, provided it's, it's modest. Right? That's, and it's simple. So you, you want to wear the veil? All you ladies at the back, that's fine. I, I don't know where you got the idea I'm against it. Christians should not be against it. You want to do it? That's That's fine. The only thing I would say is that the Bible nowhere says that we have to do it. The, the, the Bible nowhere says that we have to do it. It says that women are to dress 
simply and modestly. Okay? So, I'm not against it. Not at all. And I think I've exhausted my questions. One thing I just remembered. Last night's subject actually was talking about the devil, the shaitan in Arabic or devil, and how his deception is to guide people away, misguide them. And there was something that happened tonight, and I was thinking, how do you deal that? Because I always like to try to find the positive side about everything. Because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us, Ajib, amazing is the condition of a believer because only good things happen to him. When the good things of this world come his way, he's thankful to Allah. He said, Alhamdulillah, thank you to Allah. And when any difficulty or trial or calamity comes his way, he's patient. Like Job, he was patient. And it's good for him, but this only works for the believers. So when I see difficulties and people doing some things, I got to remember to look for the positive side. And I remember a story when I was a small boy that I heard this. There was a lady in the community, an old lady. She was the sweetest lady there ever was. She always had a kind word for everybody. They couldn't get her to say anything bad about it as single soul. So if you know how it works in the church, after the sermon, when everybody's leaving, the pastor stands at the door and shakes hands with everybody as they leave. So two little mischievous boys had figured out something really good that they were going to play a trick on this poor old lady. Just as she got up to the preacher, and just as he was shaking her hand and telling her, have a nice week, all this kind of thing, Lord bless you, the boys said to her, Miss Jones, Miss Jones, can we ask you something? What do you say about the devil? Right in front of the preacher now. See? What do you say about the devil? She said, well, you know, he's very energetic. <laughs> and I got to give him that. He's energetic. Before I begin to try to answer these questions, I have to tell you that I receive a lot of questions in email and questions that come from the audiences around the world where I visit. Sometimes the questions are very, very harsh and sometimes they're even ludicrous. But I have to follow what I just got through preaching which is, I have to find the good in it. So when people say things like, why are all Muslims terrorists? And when they say things like, why do all Muslims beat their wives? I'm from Texas, and my wife is too. Don't even think about it, okay? <laughs> she kill you. <laughs> but they say these things, and worse, and I tell the Muslims, do not respond and kind. Don't do that. Don't reply back to what other people have done to you because then you stoop to their level. If you want to excel, if you want to raise something up, you have to be positive and you have to follow the example. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was abused much worse than any of us. He was carrying a message to the people and he was abused. They lied about him. They fabricated things against him. They spit on him. They beat him almost to death in front of the Kaaba. And he ventured out all the way to Ataif, which is quite a journey. I was over there this year. That's a long, you don't want to walk over there, even on the road. And they didn't have them back then. And when he got there, he wanted to talk to the tribal leaders who were distant relatives. And the custom of the Arabs is no matter what, when somebody comes to visit you, you give them carte blanche. You take care of them completely for three days and nights without a question. You do that. But when he arrived, they didn't extend that courtesy to him. 
They made jokes about him, laughed about him, and made snide remarks, but they wouldn't even allow him an opportunity to voice what he wanted to say, which was really simple. There's only one God. You should worship him alone without partners because those people were all pagans. They had false gods, idols, statues, things like that. And instead, they took the children of the street, you know, the urchins in the street, and sick them on him like a dog. And those children were throwing stones on him and his companion until blood was running down his body, and it was filling his sandals. His shoes were filling with his own blood. And he was running away from these people. When he was outside of the area of the city, the angel Jabril, Gabriel came to him, the same as he had come before, the same angel that came to Miriam, peace be upon her, to tell her of the good news of the miracle birth, the same angel, and told him that God is ready to command that those two mountains come down on the people of a tithe and destroy them. Say the word. Did he do it? What did he do? He raised his hands, which is something Muslims do. We raise our hands and we make dua. He prayed for them. You pray for your enemies. You want to know why the Muslims are suffering in the world today? Because we don't follow the example. And Allah is punishing us. You've heard the expression, you don't take the law into your own hands. That's not just talking about the government laws of Australia, United States, Canada, or Great Britain. It's when you take the laws of God into your own hands and you play like God. We don't have that right. And it's not for me to stand up here and try to act like I'm any better than anybody else. I'm probably the worst person here. Some of these questions are pretty hateful. But you know what? I forgive you. And I pray for you. The ones that I can repeat, I will say. Why are you left Jesus and perfect salvation for a religion of terrorism? I want to repeat the question because I want to show you guys how to answer the question yourself. When people talk to you like that, do not respond back. And as I've heard so many times since I've been up here talking about smashing people. Doesn't work. This is not the reply of a Muslim. And you'll never get the agenda with that attitude. I'm talking to the Muslims. You non-Muslims, just relax. I'm picking on them right now. The best way, and we have examples on our websites at islamalways.com. If you don't know about our website, that's one of the things I'm always promoting to people to go visit because it's free. You can get a free Quran online there. You can get free books, translations to English, and learn experiences of real people and what they go through in Islam. It's there. But the way to answer a question like that is to start positive and say thank you for asking me about my religion because in Islam there are two things you need to know first of all I cannot tell you a lie I have to tell you the truth and that's another point my dear respected brothers in Islam and sisters don't lie Allah said in the Quran ya yulidina amanu wa wa kulu kaulan sadida O oh, you who Claim to believe in Allah. I said it that way because I've seen some things I don't like. Those of you who believe in Allah have taqwa for Him. And you know it's taqwa. Fear Him. And always speak the truth. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked about three kinds of people. What if somebody is Joban, a coward, and runs away from battlefront? Could he still be a believer? He said, yes. Nah. He said, what if he's bakhil, which means stingy, and he won't give anything? Could he still be a believer? He said, nah. Yes. It means yes. He said, what if he was kadib, a liar? Could he still be a believer? He said, nah. No. 
So for sure, when I answer your question, I have to tell the truth or be silent. The second point is, even if I didn't tell you the truth, you could find out fast enough because we have the proof. Everything about Islam has been recorded and preserved for 1,400 years. Eyewitnesses, Muslims and non-Muslims both, have recorded a long history of what's taken place since the time and the advent of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's there. A lot of it's on my website, translated to English. Go read it. And if you find a mistake, tell me. But it's there. Then come to your third point. You keeping up with me? Thank you for asking me about my religion. Have to tell the truth, and we do have the resources to prove. And now this point. A lot of questions are not really questions. A lot of questions today are designed like journalists present things. And what it is, it's a statement with a question mark to disguise the real intent. And I use this example because it becomes real clear. A journalist runs up to you with his microphone, sticks it in your face and says, can you answer a question, yes or no? You go, yeah. Is your mother out of jail yet? My mother's not, no, yes or no? Well, she's not in jail. Yes or no? Okay, yes, she's out of jail. Good, I'm glad she got out. And this is what kind of choice you give me with a question like that. But I will try to tell you the, my reason for coming into Islam. Because I see it as even a better understanding of true salvation. And because I read the Bible so many times and read the Quran in the English translation, compared with Kone Greek and Hebrew and then Arabic, it became clear to me from the two books that I read that both of them said that Jesus was telling the people, both of the books say the same thing, he was telling the people, worship your God and my God, your Lord and my Lord. And I said, wait a minute. Muslims do that. They worship the Lord of Jesus. His, which is who? Even Christian Arabs will tell you Allah. They say Allah. Like I told you, I have Arabic Bible, if anybody doubts it. I don't see me turning my back on Jesus. I love him more now than I did before. Even when I was a preacher in Christianity, I didn't spend as much time thinking about Jesus and God as I do now. Every Muslim, even the bad Muslims, still think about God every single day. I want to encourage you to understand Muslims, even the bad ones, do have a strong belief. And I'd like for the non-Muslims to help me encourage them to practice the real Islam so you can see something really nice and you can get along really great. I see myself as just stepping up. I see myself as somebody who now understands because I have the original message, still the original text. I don't have to worry about somebody's interpretation of what somebody translated from Kone Greek to Latin to English and then retranslated it while they were standing at the podium. Okay, next one. What is the ultimate triumph? That was, by the way, the real name of this program tonight. What is the ultimate triumph? And I guess we kind of got away from it. I guess the ultimate triumph would be that we could do what it says in the Lord's Prayer. There's one word that I will tell you the Muslim can't swallow that word. Can't swallow that word. I have to tell you about that, but after that I want to read the prayer to you. The first word that I'm going to tell you that, we, that they're not going to take it is to call God the Father. They're not going to take that. Because this puts God really low when you do that. And it's not fair to compare Almighty God to only one half 
of your parents. With that having been said, the Lord's Prayer in English reads something like this. And I'll use the word Lord if you don't mind. Our Lord which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Every Muslim has to hold sacred all the names of Allah. All 99 names of Allah. He's the most merciful, the most gracious, the most honored, the majestic. He is the ultimate peace. He is the ultimate love. He's all praise. Allah is 99 beautiful characteristics and attributes, none of them compared to his creation. The all patient. The all latif, latif. What is latif in English? Most softly kind. It doesn't have a word to it for latif. It says, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what we're talking about. That's what Islam is. Doing what God wants you to do and stop doing the stuff you want to do. Give us this day our daily bread. Muslims know we call Allah by his name. al razak the one who provides, give us our provision. Yes? And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The Muslim has been instructed to forgive. Listen to this story from Muhammad, peace be upon him. He told his companions, next guy that comes through the gate, through the door, he's somebody from the paradise. Guy came in, they didn't recognize him. Who is this guy? And then another time he said, next one that comes through the gate, he's from paradise. Same guy came in again. They were going, hey, we've got to find out about this guy. So one of them went over to him. He said, you know, uh, I need to hang out at your place. I got some problems with my family, you know. Uh, I need to stay with you. So I told you, like three days. They gave him the three days. Let him come in and stay there. So he watched the guy. He observed him from the time he got up to the time he went to bed, watching him. What's this guy do? What's this guy do? And on the third day, he said, okay, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't really have any problem at home. I just wanted to come and observe you. He said, why? And he told him what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had said. About the guy that comes in, he's going to be from paradise. We just want to know what you do. He said, I don't do anything special. Really, you guys are better than me. I can't imagine what it would be. Except... Here it comes. <laughs> Except that at night, just before I go to sleep, I forgive everybody. I forgive everybody. So there's a real beautiful lesson for the Muslims. At night, before you go to bed, forgive everybody. Because if you can't forgive the people, how do you expect Allah to forgive you? And it's in Islam that if you can't show mercy, you won't be shown any mercy. The ultimate triumph, that would be the ultimate triumph, is when Jesus comes and all those who really believe follow him. And we know that's going to be from anybody on earth. That can be Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus. If they wake up, recognize the truth, and want to follow him, they'll be in the right way. Simple as that. What a great triumph that would be. How does somebody become a Muslim? Well, that, I like that question. First, you have to believe God is one. One. And one equals one. Not two, not three, and not twelve. Next, you have to obey his commandments. If you say, I love God, but I don't want to do his commandments, then that's not love. So this is hand in glove. You've got to put that together. Allah tells us in the Quran about a beautiful salvation. He says he does not forgive shirk. He does not forgive anybody to make associates with him in worship. But anything less than that, he can forgive. Anything less than that, he can forgive. That's pretty merciful. 
How can one be assured a place in heaven? <laughs> if it was a gut cinch, if it was for sure you had it, there'd be a line at the door. We'd all be willing to sign up for it, charge it to my MasterCard and go for it. We'd do it. But because there's another one similar, I'll just put them together. Explain to non-Muslims how we can also die sinless. Don't ever do anything wrong, I guess. The concept of sin in Islam, let me explain something to you. We don't have exactly the same understanding. Okay? In Islam, just so you know, next time, it doesn't say this in the Quran. It's very clear in the Quran. La yukallifu lahu nafsan illa wusaha. La hama kasabat wa aleha maktasabat. And this is the theme throughout the whole Quran. It doesn't contradict that statement. Nobody carries the burden of anyone else when it comes to sin. Nobody's going to be asked what somebody else did on the day of judgment. Nobody's going to escape from what they did. It's all going to be there. I can't put my stuff on you, nor can you put it on me. It doesn't work like that. No soul carries the burden of another. But, for sure, there is grace, there's mercy, because Allah can forgive. He can just forgive you, unless you do the big mistake, which is to make partners with Him in worship. Assuredness, again, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave us a clear picture of that. He had led the prayer in the afternoon, and he turned to his companions while he was sitting there, and he looked at them, and he used to give them advice. And he said, you know, no one will enter paradise except by the grace, rahmatullah, the Almighty's grace. They said, even you? He said, even me. So without Allah's grace... Nobody's going to make it. I always ask him for that every day. Somebody said that the Spirit of the Lord is speaking through me. <laughs> I think the Lord could do a lot better than that. <laughs> but I, I respect what he said. And, and another one, and another one says, about loving God and Jesus, etc. Where does it say in the Quran that God loves me as a person? It's in Surah Al-Baruj, chapter 85, verse 14. If you don't have a Quran, go to my website. You're welcome to download it. See for yourself. He's called Al-Wadud, which is the epitome of real love, all loving. But there's something else that I'm going to just stop because I don't feel like going through this anymore. just want to sum it up, end it with this. Islam is, as I already told you, a verb. It's an action of what you do. But it represents something very big when it comes here to us. Islam brings the rights that human beings want and need. But it also brings the balance of limitations. There are limits set on all of us. We have rights, but we have limits. And you're asking about where does God love me? And there's the answer he tells you. But there's another verse in the beginning of the Quran that states the opposite side. What about your love for him? What about your love for him? <laughs> they came to Muhammad Sallallahu saying, well, we love God, we love God. And look at the answer. God, Allah is telling him, tell these guys, Say, if you really love Allah, then you follow me. Because then and only then will Allah love you. And he'll forgive your sins. 
because he's the forgiver and he is the merciful. I hope that good came from our meeting tonight. If there was any good here tonight, it was only from the Lord above. Any mistakes are from me, and I ask a lot of forgive me for that. If anybody here tonight understood this message and feels that this is the time for them to make a commitment that they want to work toward doing this project that I talked about, this ultimate triumph, who wants to declare, yes, there is God, and in the name of God, I want to stand here side by side with my fellow human beings, my fellow brothers from Adam, and in the name of that God, I want us to work together for that and declare that, then I think it's a good time for us to stand up and show that. One of the questions that we did receive, they were asking about why Islam is the fastest growing religion today. I want to mention this for the benefit of the Muslims. It's not because you're so great that everybody's attracted to Islam. It's nothing that we're doing that makes Islam look that good. But in fact, it's because of the guidance from Almighty God. When people ask to be guided, He guides them to this straight path. In Alhamdulillah, in the United States, we have seen a large number on a daily basis regularly entering into Islam. But the amazing thing is that we see anywhere from eight to 10 women for every single man. And I can't explain that phenomenon, but it's also true in other countries in Europe that I visited like Sweden, Denmark. It's the same in Canada. Definitely true in, Ca in uh, Mexico. And I've been told that the same is true here, that for every one man who enters into Islam, you have something like eight to 10 women. Can't explain it, but it's a phenomenon worldwide. It's also funny in a way because one of the things that the critics against Islam constantly try to hammer on is the fact they say Islam is so abusive to women. And if that's the case, why are so many going to it? But in any case, last night we were privileged to have two that entered into Islam there. Alhamdulillah. We had one that other occasion I had last week. We had one. And now I'm told that there are some who would like to enter Islam here tonight. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Okay, hold my hand. So I won't run away. You ready? Okay. Now we're going to say it. Is English okay? Yeah. English? Yeah. Okay. Then you say after me, I bear witness. I bear witness. There's no God to worship. There's no God to worship. Except one God. Except one God. And I bear witness. I bear witness. Muhammad's his messenger. Muhammad's his messenger. Okay, now we're going to do the Arabic, okay? Uh, Maybe your Arabic's better than mine. You know Arabic? A little bit. A little bit? Okay, say, Ashadu. Ashadu. An la ilaha. An la ilaha. La ilaha. La ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa. Wa. Ashadu. Ashadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. That's all. Allah Akbar. <laughs> The meaning behind the Shahada, when a person says that they bear witness there's only one God to worship, means they believe in the God of Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Solomon, David, and Muhammad. And that they believe in the messengership of all those prophets and that they're going to try to live up to it. But when a person says it with sincerity, all of their sins are forgiven since the time they were born until that moment. And then they're replaced with an equal amount of good deeds. So he has mountains of good deeds and no bad deeds. Alhamdulillah.
One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have Seen Me Pray, Words, Ramadan, Renewal of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.